So I would like to welcome uh, Rob Hope uh, to the podcast uh, today, and uh, we're delighted to have him um, to speak with us. And uh, Rob is a professor of uh, water policy at the School of Geography and Environment at Oxford University. Uh, his research uh, focuses on water policy, poverty and economics, uh, primarily in Africa and Asia. Um, he's led many large programs over the years, Reach, Uptime, uh, been involved with Uptime and has been working with various groups, including governments, NGOs and communities to expand access to safe drinking water. Um, much of your work, Rob, it seems, focuses on Ethiopia and Kenya in East Africa and Bangladesh in South Asia. Um, so thanks so much for taking the time to, to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. Um, so maybe we start off, uh, Rob, uh, with a, a recent paper that you have published in, in Nature Water on science practitioner partnerships for sustainable development. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading that. And uh, it's interesting to hear your thoughts on how to uh, link science um, with uh, communities and governments and other groups uh, uh, to develop sustainable water access. Uh, so maybe uh, you can describe how the role of science varies with time as the programs develop and things like that. Sure. Well, thank you for the invitation, Bridget. Uh, great pleasure to be here today. Um, yes, the, the sort of recent paper in Nature Water is a collaborative affair with um, many colleagues in Africa and Asia and also through the REACH program where we've reflected over the last 10 years, I guess, in terms of the um, evolving ro role of science that it increasingly has an impact side to that, that scientists have always, I think, been interested in that, but has the science funding provided the means um, by which scientists can use their science to influence um, policy and practice. Um, so the paper tries to explore some of these issues and you know, thinks through over time how science can contribute, particularly to the practitioner space, um, around some of these sort of you know, enduring challenges that we have, whether it's um, pollution, whether it's flooding or droughts or drinking water services, what roles that we play. And we, we try and think about it in very sort of four broad buckets, I guess. Um, first is the foundational science, so the sort of the bread and butter, the things that we do advancing our agendas as we go forward. Um, and explore this in a second area in terms of um, how this may be worked through in terms of advisory science, though so how we then translate and communicate that to policy audiences in a collaborative um, fashion. We then discuss a third area, which is more of operational science, which I guess is one of the newer areas that we're looking at. So after that phase, how do scientists stay engaged after projects end? How do we stay engaged in this process to help um, governments and partners um, modify and adapt and scale up or scale out their programs of work? And then the fourth dimension we talk to is um, evaluative science. So the things, again, that we're quite familiar with in terms of how we evaluate what we're doing. And I, I guess the broad argument within the paper, certainly for many partners in Africa and Asia and some of these geographies, is just to have more patient um, and sustainable funding that allows this process, which takes you know potentially a decade or more, to be available. And how we think you know to um, put together programs um, of of scientific funding that allows that to happen. Um, and you know we'll talk a little bit about the Reach program that's been doing this for a number of years now. Um, but there have been lots of other programs that we we feature in the paper as well. Right. Well, I think it was very enlightening and, you know, it's nice to consider these different types of science and how they can play a role. I mean, foundational science, sometimes I think we we don't do enough of it because people don't see that it's applicable and, and they're kind of unwilling. Unless they see a return immediately, they're not willing to do it. And sometimes in, in some of these developing countries, we're relying on maps that were developed during the colonial era. You know, it's just ridiculous. They did more back then, I think, than than we are doing today. And, you know, we have so many tools now, geophysical tools and all sorts of things to apply. And so I think, uh, you know, there seems to be a need uh, for more of that. Um, you mentioned operational science and, and operational aspects in general. I mean, you know, 
reading some of your papers and others, you know, sustainable development goal 6.1, uh, you know, still, I think, like half a billion people without access to safe water. And so oftentimes NGOs and other groups uh, install capital equipment and everything to provide access to water and then leave the scene. And, uh, you know, uh, so staying engaged and uh, looking at the operational aspects, I think, is becoming more and more important. And I think agencies like USAID and others are, are acknowledging that and, uh, and trying to develop these sorts of things. I mean, I think you've been very fortunate with the REACH program having a 10-year uh, lifespan. Most of us are looking at one to two years of funding for anything, and you barely get to know the players but to develop that trust with them, especially if you're working with these communities, it, it takes a long time. So very enlightening and uh, hope uh, that that might help change some of the funding models for science in the future. Um, you know, you mentioned in some of your work also, Rob, that um, working with governments and governance issues and things like that is so important. And I think in Bangladesh, uh, uh, you describe in some of your papers, uh, you know, the pollution issues in the surface water in, in Dhaka and, and places like that. And, and, you know, what they're trying to do with the planned uh, water, sewage water treatment plants and, you know, how your work then can help optimize the locations and the the ranking of these systems. I think they're planning on building maybe 12 or before 2030. And, you know, maybe you can describe that a little bit and how you are engaged with the government in some of that aspect. Of course. I mean, I think, um, I mean, the area that we've worked with is in, in Dhaka and looking at sort of river water pollution. So this has been sort of part of the REACH program with um, our collaborators in Bangladesh, academic partners, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology in particular, um, but also a lot of the government of authorities. There's around 20 agencies that have some responsibility for water resources or water services. So you end up with, you know, you know, the inevitable coordination challenges. But when we when we started the work, there was a lot of very good work going on by many, many partners. But what didn't really exist was some of the foundational science in terms of a complete river system model um, in DACA that has, you know, the um two of the major rivers flow down there, the Brahmaputra and the um, the, the Ganges, the, the Padma in Bangladesh. And this creates this, you know, very amazing network of about 12 river systems that throw, that flow through Dhaka that makes hydrological model modeling quite difficult. I'm an economist, so I'm always humbled by my colleagues who managed to work these things out. But it was a gap in the current scientific or policy landscape that they didn't really have a model that could look at the hydrological flows and particularly water water quality. Bangladesh, as uh, many of us know, has been through this remarkable development cycle since independence in 1971, where its um, GDP per capita now is higher than India and Pakistan. It's been a remarkable um, growth over period. And some of it's been related to sort of quite rapid industrialization, particularly in the ready-made garment sector. But as in the history of the US or Europe, this comes at a cost. Um, there are damages to the environment. And it's not unique to the garment industry necessarily, but it's um, non-point um, pollution from agriculture. A lot of sewage, around 80%, is released untreated. So you've got this cocktail that flows into the system that creates um, lots of challenges. So some of the the foundational work that the the team were leading on this was to try and do sort of basic monitoring of river water quality in the river systems, and then developed a you know a process based hydrological model that could look at um, the spatial and tem temporal distribution of where pollution was. And we had a particular interest in understanding which social groups were in harm's way. Um, with a view that these investments that the government and um, development partners are putting in around $20 billion worth of um, water treatment infrastructure over the next 25 years, how do you sequence and prioritize those so that you reduce the pollution, but also you make sure that those vulnerable people benefit from this as, you know, as soon as possible? So I think I completely agree with you. The foundational science, if you don't have that there, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're doing this blind, you don't know what you're doing, and then it becomes political. Um, and you just get suboptimal results as a as a consequence of that. And generally, the, the poorer, more vulnerable people um, have less voice in the process and benefit less as a consequence. 
I think it's great that, you know, oftentimes we're talking about water resources and looking for new resources and everything like that. But I mean, managing uh, wastewater and considering one water, you know, so that we're not polluting water is so important. And and sometimes uh, I know I spoke recently with Davina Srinivas in, uh, in um, Bangalore, and she was emphasizing the importance of that, too. But uh the economic drivers are not there to manage it that well. But it's, with the government in Bangladesh then emphasizing that, I think that's great. And also uh, talking with Charlie Forrest Marty in the past, you know, it seemed like we have this, um, um, you know, uh, impair and then repair. You know, it seemed like with uh, um, economic development, we impair the systems and then we have the money that we can repair them. It seems like we can never short circuit that and avoid impairing, it seems like. Um, so you've also been working with the government in uh, Bangladesh uh, on uh, school systems and clinics and uh, providing water uh, for the uh, for these systems so that students have access to safe water. Um, and uh, in the past, it seemed like it was the teacher's responsibility to do do this. And so maybe you can describe that a little bit, uh, Rob. What what's happening there? Sure. I mean, th this is the work that I've been more directly involved in. Um, so we've been looking here, and this is uh, how you provide safety managed drinking water to people, not only in their communities, but also in schools and healthcare facilities. So globally, the figures, the estimates is around 2 billion people don't have these safely managed services. And water quality is a real major consideration here. And the program has looked at this, you know, very carefully. Um, and particularly in coastal Bangladesh, where we've worked with the government as a priority area, it's um, it, it's the four riders of the apocalypse in coastal Bangladesh because you've got the Ganges, uh, Brahmaputra, Meghna, 93% of the flow comes down through the monsoon cycle. Um, you've got cyclonic storms before the monsoon that flow up and create um, um, damage as a consequence of that, depending on the year. You often have, um, you know, bacteri bacteriological contamination above ground, um, and then you've got arsenic salinity below ground. So it's a really, really complex environment to live in and try and provide services. So this is why the government rightly saw this as an area that they they saw was very vulnerable. And what we were trying to help them through was thinking through institutional models of how could, they could rethink the process in which they they supply water. So Bangladesh has been very successful in improving access. So they've made access available um, to some somewhere in the region, 99% of the people in the country. But the water services side of things in terms of the quality, the reliability, affordability of the services are not, is an ongoing challenge. So we had a particular focus to try and rethink from just giving access to a school so you're a head teacher in school and we come in and sort of say right here's a here's a tube well or a pipe system now in terms of you know not only teaching and managing in your school you've got to manage this water pump so you'll probably be very good at it Bridget but most some people <laughs> struggle with it to some degree so we were trying to we've been developing these ideas in other countries of professional service delivery models so like a utility like an urban utility they're responsible for a geographic area for all of the water infrastructure, and they have to be accountable for the reliability and the water quality of services. So we did this um, over a sort of 18-month pilot period, got very good results in terms of um, dramatically improving the water safety, um, bacteriological and chemically, and also the reliability of the systems. The government's been very pleased with that. It's very low cost. So as an economist, you sort of look at the costings of this and it's less than one US dollar per person per year. So it becomes relatively affordable. So the government's now put this um, into their national budgets to support this program to 2030 in this one district, the 64 districts, but they've made that commitment um, and putting in 50% of the operational costs, which is quite an unusual thing. Governments generally build things, they don't maintain things. So this is quite a change. And then we have um, donors who will support the other costs, which are quite modest. Over the seven years for the one district, it's around two uh, million dollars, which is you know a drop in the ocean given you know how things are spent in the sector. So that's very encouraging. Um, and I think it's a lot of credit to the government. They set up a national steering committee to look at this very carefully. 
um, headed by senior government officials, you know, through health, education, local government, et cetera. UNICEF were a key partner in this as well. And then the University of Oxford and our partners, we worked in terms of helping them design the system. And now we would look to sort of see how we scale it up in Bangladesh, but also how it may be applicable in, in other countries in the future. And it's great to have the, the government involved and, and more likely to have the longevity then and, and, and maintenance and then expansion and scaling up. So uh, that's great. I know, uh, you know, sometimes you think, oh, well, let's just do it ourselves, you know, and, and, and it's easier. But uh, developing all those connections and making that happen, I, I am very impressed. Um, you also mentioned when we spoke recently about another program in India, the Jal Jeevan mission uh, to provide access uh, to uh, tap water for all households uh, by 2024. Um, and I guess this is, are you, are you very involved in that program or are you just kind of on the outside providing some advice and any thoughts about it? Well, it's, it's, it's a remarkable program. So it was um, Prime Minister Modi's commitment in 2019 when he was elected um, to give um, all 1.4 billion citizens in India a functional household tap connection. A remarkable, ambitious, I mean, staggering proposal. I mean, they've spent an estimated 70 to 80 billion US dollars on this at the moment. So India has the economic clout and the ability to do that, but they also have the leadership. And um, it's, you know, it's something, you know, for the sector that I work in, it, it's wonderful to see that leadership as it just flows down the system um, in terms of state governments and then district governments then implementing that. So we we have some sort of, you know, modest engagement in that program and in a couple of th with the state governments, looking at how they then look at the operational sustainability, because the, the big push at the moment is to build the infrastructure this year and they're around 80% coverage. So they won't get there, I don't think, but they'll get very, very close from a base of around 20%. So it's a remarkable achievement. But then the longer term achievement is to make sure the infrastructure keeps working and delivering those services. So we're trying to, um, you know, similar to Bangladesh, to some degree, think of what the institutional the funding model for that would be um, in the future to try and support that. And with a view to try and document it as well. So other governments could look at that and hopefully they can sort of see these things um, are potentially achievable in in lots of other geographies that um, you know need need these types of services desperately. Yeah, I, I that's fantastic, and uh, you know, as you say, also installing the systems, but also maintaining the operations, and then the financing and uh, and maintenance of those things would be critical because I think. Uh, it, I'm not sure what the numbers are, maybe, but half of the water point systems in sub-Saharan Africa are non-functional. And so maintenance and all of that sort of thing is critical. Um, we've mentioned the REACH program a couple of times, and I think uh, you've served as the principal investigator of that program, I guess, uh, from uh, extended from 2015 to 2024 and uh, and uh, supported by the UK um FCDO, uh, forget what that stands for, Foreign Commonwealth uh, and Development Office. Right. Um, and I guess the idea, the goal was to provide safe water to 12, 10 million people, uh, focusing on Ethiopia, Kenya, and uh, Bangladesh. Um, so uh, that's been a huge program and uh, very impressive. Maybe you can describe a little bit about that and uh, the ideas that you have learned uh, from that uh, that could be applied elsewhere also. Sure. So the, the program specifically is about being improving water security for 10 million vulnerable people in those in Africa and Asia, based on the three geographies you mentioned, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And as we're aware, Bridget, and I think many of your people on this podcast have talked about, I mean, the whole water security agenda has, has grown quite dramatically over the last 10, 15, 20 years, particularly between the intersection between water resources, the climate systems, hydrology, surface water, groundwater, and then water services that are used by industry, for municipal supply, for agriculture, for the environment. And that intersection was one of the things that FCDO were particularly interested in, in terms of how it could help more vulnerable people. In, in different geographies. So traditionally, you separate them out. People look at the water resource side and focus on that. Other people look at the water services side and never the twain meet. Um, and so they were sort of saying, how do you look at this um, to sort of to help out people who are most in need? 
the way the way that we've looked at it um, predominantly, and you know, some of it sort of gets mentioned in the, the Nature Water paper is through these observatories that we identified in the country. So these are long term interdisciplinary instrumented um, locations where we look at a particular water security challenge and they vary in all the different loca locations. So we've mentioned the DACA one about river water security. This was the challenge there that there was the big gap that people didn't understand. We've done work in um, northern Kenya and Takana looking at um, groundwater security, particularly in relation to climate and climate change um, and how that works. In Ethiopia, we've looked at water allocation in the Awash River Basin, which is the large river basin that in, in which Addis Ababa is, is located as well. So we look at you know very specific issues um, guided by our sort of government and pra practitioner partners. We don't set the agenda. We try and work out what science that you know we could potentially provide and then set on looking at a specific water security challenge and how and how that may be addressed. And I guess uh, one of the critical issues then is um, maintaining these systems and, and financing them. Maybe you can talk a little bit and then monitoring whether they're uh, operating or not. And maybe that's where uptime uh, comes in, um, where you're partnering with 16 different countries, I understand, uh, you know, to, to look at the, the volume that's being pumped, uh, the um, revenue and the reliability and the water quality, and then subsidizing, you know, some of those um, systems. Um, so I guess reach and uptime uh, programs are somewhat uh, linked, are they? Or, you know, one evolved from the other or? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're quite closely associated. I mean, there's, um, you know, strong partnerships. So um, we have um, worked quite closely together. I mean, uptime has been um, looking, as you've sort of said, at this issue of um, maintenance and sustainability challenges, specifically in rural water areas, in rural areas in Africa and Asia, and also Latin America now. So very much to the point that you mentioned that infrastructure is built, but then it's not maintained. And part of that is a financial challenge. Um, the World Bank estimates that urban water systems have um, somewhere in the region of a $300 billion subsidy each year, excluding India and China. So it's a huge subsidy that goes into urban water where you generally have higher levels of um, wealth and employment. You have pipe systems, you have economies of scale and things like that. You look at the rural landscape where people are more remote, they're scattered, often lower education, lower and more variable income. The opportunity to get full cost recovery in rural areas is very rare, in my opinion. So you have to be realistic and think there is a subsidy challenge. And how do you address that subsidy challenge to make sure you get these reliable and safe services? So this is what Uptime has been trying to look at, designing standardized contracts where you've got good verifiable data that allows donors to pay the subsidy based on the results. So you de-risk it, the results are provided, and then based on those results, the payments are made. So this is what we've been piloting in different countries since 2018. And now we're um, around 16 countries and the safe Pani model in Bangladesh that we've spoken about, uptime will um, provide the subsidy with the government. So we will work with the government um, to you know cover cover off that um, remaining subsidy, which is which is again is quite modest. Globally, it's less than one US dollar per year to do that sort of work. And it's starting to get corporate interest. Corporates are looking at this. I think they've been very um, disappointed, should we say, um, over the years because they've built the infrastructure under a lot of advocacy to help people. But then, you know, the systems fall apart, they're abandoned, and this is problematic. So the corporates, I think, are interested in this. They, you know, are engaging in some of our work in some of these countries um, if they can sort of see a very clear outcome to the work and they don't face you know risks of you know investing in things that then fail which then becomes problematic on on lots of levels and in terms of the links within reach what's been very interesting the cross fertilization of science etc is looking at um, rural water use behaviors so an area that i look at quite a lot um, with some of my team um, that um, people look at how people pay for water across the year and generally people, um, well, they shift to surface water often in wetter, rainier periods because the water is free. It can, um, depending on how it's stored, be safe as well. But you see this um, quite 
um, clear signal in terms of people shifting from the improved structure. So from a you know water kiosk or something of that nature in the rainy season, the volume being sold is much, much lower. And this is where the climate signal comes in, as you sort of see um, the the frequency duration onset of, of you know rainfall seasons affects these behaviors, which then um, plays through in terms of how you finance and how you set up the sort of infrastructure in these areas. So that's you know that's been interesting, and you know one of the facts from um, one of the PhD studies is that you know you sort of in wet periods you sort of see a thirty percent reduction in revenue as people start using these systems. So you can't you know plan that everybody's going to use twenty fifty liters and pay all the money every day of the year. It's just not the reality in these rural areas. And I think, uh, you know, we can do more in monitoring these systems and seeing if they're working and everything now with all of these um, uh, mobile apps and 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 sensors. And uh, uh, I think maybe you were mentioning Andrew Armstrong from Water Mission and so uh, their database uh, the, where they monitor um put in sensors to monitor pumpage and and water levels and stuff like that. So it's great to have those data then to understand if the systems are functioning and um, and where they are, where they aren't. And so that you can get services out. And I know reading some of the papers, you know, how fast you can get those services out to repair them and things like that. And, and the different types of finance models, monthly payments versus advanced payments and all this sort of thing. It gets quite complicated, but you know, we think of these things as um, issues for developing countries, but I mean, we're facing the same thing uh, here in the US and stuff. I mean, during COVID, you know, or not just during COVID, but I mean, utilities, they ask you to conserve water during drought and stuff like that. Then their revenue goes down and, and you know, they're grappling with that and they're trying to keep infrastructure going. So it's uh, it's a lot of the same type of thing. And then, you know, you mentioned urban versus rural. Um, the issue we have in the U.S. anyway is that a lot of the systems that have problems with water quality are small rural systems that have in semi-arid regions, they've only got one water source like groundwater and a lot of the contaminants are naturally occurring. So like arsenic or radionuclides or things like that, and they have to treat them. So having the expertise to do that and maintaining those systems is just overwhelming. So we talk about these things in developing countries. And I think uh, you mentioned also, you know, UK and, and Australia and other regions, a lot of similarities, uh, but maybe to a different extent. Yes, very much so. I mean, I have colleagues in the US and Canada who point out the same sort of issues, you know, with First Nations. Um, you have in Australia with the Aborigine groups, you sort of see um, enormous inequalities in terms of the services and public health outcomes. And this is, you know, some of the richest countries in the world. Um, so, the you know, these issues um, pertain there. You know, I'm based here in Oxford in the UK. We have um, you know, public health scare now with one of the pipe water systems where they have cryptosporidium that's got into the water supply and it's, uh, you know, affected quite a large number of people. Um, there was a bad case in Walkerton in Canada many decades ago now, but that changed a lot of thinking within Canada. And they have a very, very good Canada water agency now that has got much clearer evidence and regulation um, to, you know, enforce these things. But, you know, it, it can happen in the in the wealthiest countries and there's plenty of documented cases. So it's the institutional structures, having the, the right data, having the right accountability for these systems and the the, the right financing. Um, often people are very reticent to pay for drinking water. I mean, it's something, you know, um, you know, you'll be familiar with the Irish case. There's been um, lots of riots around um, a number of years ago about bringing that in, which you will know a lot more than I will. And, you know, it ended up the government took that on. Um, ultimately, people will pay because they'll pay through their taxes. It's not that it's free anymore, but it's just a circular route to pay for the water. But you know, no politician's going to say that because they won't. They won't survive the next election, likely as not. Right, and you mentioned cryptosporidium issues. I think in Western Ireland they have a lot of problems with that there and the treatment systems and stuff like that. And I think one of the interesting things is that in the US. Um, 
They put forward $50 billion for the bipartisan infrastructure law to provide water mm-hmm. uh, money for water infrastructure, uh, clean water and safe drinking water and stuff like that. But it's all capital expenses. There is nothing for operations. And so I think, there, you know, that's missing. Uh, you know, you install all this expensive capital equipment, but then they can't manage it or keep it going. I think that's a big issue. And I think USAID and other groups are recognizing they need to stay in the game and and uh, make sure that it main, that they maintain operations of these systems. So I think that's very important. Um, you know, going back to your recent paper in Nature Water, you know, you talk about foundational science and uh, you there are some nice examples in some of your other papers. Uh, uh, the Lodwar alluvial aquifer system is very interesting. And then how you link that to climate. And we've seen in the Horn of Africa, you know, uh, you know, long term droughts uh, over many w- rainy seasons and then recently very wet periods. So nothing in between, really, it's just either. Uh, drought or flood, and 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 that's very challenging uh, for water systems. Uh, and then also, I think um, work in coastal Kenya, uh, where you've got um, salinity issues and others, and industrial programs, titanium mining, and other things. So, how to maybe you can describe those uh, cases a little bit? I think they were very interesting, Ladwar and uh, coastal Kenya issues. Well, I mean, this is work that's been led by the University of Nairobi. So the, the good scientist there, Professor Daniel Alago, and and his team has led this work, which we've been happy to collaborate with. Um, but um, what they've been looking at, um, sp- specifically in Lodwar, which is the capital of Takana County, which is one of these poster counties for drought, um, unfortunately. I mean, they they suffer a disproportionate amount of, of drought in that re- region, which causes you know extreme human hardship and, and suffering. Um, and the the small urban centers around 80 ninety thousand people that live there depend very much on this um this alluvial aquifer system that you refer to but there hasn't been that foundational science of understanding you know the geophysical characteristics the water quality um recharge you know sustainable ab- abstraction this this is what professor Alago and his team have been doing under the reach program for a number of years working with the government to understand that to understand you know how best to manage protect and conserve the water in the reservoir to understand recharge points either through rainfall but also from a, a river the turquoise river that flows um from uganda it flows sort of northeast from uganda and is one of the the critical recharge points um but that river's un, under pressure distant from Lodois with you know plans for irrigated agriculture which would have a major implication if that happens on recharge into the aquifer but that scientific understanding then gives you know policy um makers a, a route to go forward which thankfully they have taken so there are now very strict um land management conservation protection areas to protect the aquifer certainly from um contamination as the city grows i mean people don't take these things generally very seriously unfortunately um and you can sort of see across many many cities in africa that you know there are aquifers but they're very very badly contaminated and once they're contaminated you know this much better than i it becomes difficult if not impossible to remediate um the other study which um, you mentioned in coastal Kenya, and again, um, Professor Lager and his team were involved in that, was through a NERC project that I was involved in as well, um, where you've had two large commercial interests in this very sort of sleepy part of southern coastal Kenya on the border of Tanzania. There was um, about $1 billion of commercial investment in irrigated sugarcane. And also this large titanium mine um, run by an Australian company. And then they both arrived and started pretty much at the same time. And obviously water and water resources was, was extremely important. There was some surface water, but there was also a need to use the groundwater. And again, Professor Alago's team um, looked at the characterization and um, he established that there were these two paleo channels, these sort of ancient riverbeds, which ended up being very um, generous supports, um, supplies of, of water. Um, and the the interesting thing for me as a sort of non-specialist in this area is that the um, the, agri- the irrigated agricultural company and the titanium mining company, they would have licenses to drill boreholes to get water. Sometimes they would get lucky and get very high production boreholes, then other times they'd get unlucky. And nobody had the spatial analysis to understand they were either going in or outside of the paleo channels. 
So when the studies was published, then it became a lot clearer and they were very fortunate. They've got a very good sustainable supply of water resources now in this area. The World Bank and other groups are looking to invest and, you know, take advantage of that. But this is the foundational point that, you know, you, 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 you pointed to, if you don't have that, you're just guessing. So licenses were being given for water that nobody had any idea, you know, what quantity, what quality was there, but people would pay, they would get a license and it was not the most, um, you know, sort of sustainable way to approach things. Uh, yeah, I think uh, geophysics is amazing, and uh, I think we're seeing more and more of it applied in uh, not just water dousing <laughs> anymore, but uh, geophysics and uh, uh, Grunfoss Foundation uh, and uh, University of Aarhus has uh, uh, a transient uh, electromagnetic system that they drive over and map. So it's a, another set of eyes to see what's uh, happening in the subsurface, and and having that understanding, then you can much better manage. Uh, the resource and understand what you have. Uh, but I mean, we're still doing that in the US. I mean, uh, in the last several years, um, uh, the uh, Rosemary Knight in um, Stanford has been doing airborne electromagnetics for the Central Valley Aquifer. And uh, that helps understand where they could do managed aquifer recharge and where paleo channels are and all of that sort of thing. So uh, so we're all trying to uh, get into the game because if we're going to manage the subsurface, we need to kind of have a bit of an understanding about what it looks like and what we're dealing with. Uh, so that's uh, really interesting. And I think another thing that you emphasize in some of your work is uh, the linkage between climate and um, and the hydrology and, uh, you know, these extremes that we've been experiencing. And I'm not sure if you interact much with the famine early warning system, people like Chris Funk and others. Uh, and mm -hmm. if you had that uh, predictive skill, then would be would you be better able to manage? Because, you know, Chris has been able to um, uh, project uh, forecast and maybe six months out, you know, whether they're going to get uh, rain or not and then that allows the agencies uh, to get together and provide funding so they they can avoid some of these famines that they've experienced in the past in Ethiopia and other regions around there so do you interact with FuseNet or you know and and I know you've been trying to link with climate uh, your work well, I mean, certainly colleagues here, again, this isn't me, but through the REACH program, one of the reasons that we chose to work in Ethiopia and Kenya is the the global climate models were very imprecise. You know, some would point in one direction, the others would point in another. Um, and one of the, the ideas um, around that is they hadn't at, um, accurately understood the topographical features in that part of Eastern Africa, particularly that area between the um, Ethiopian highlands and the Kenyan highlands in the sort of Rift Valley structure. And the, I think Chris was talking about it in his excellent episode as well, these sort of low level jets that carry, you know, vast quantities of moisture. So this is what they call locally, the sort of Takana jet. And it's estimated that 30% of the moisture that comes from the Indian ocean through um, into Africa comes through this, this jet um, across Takana and that sort of um, northern part of Kenya, southern part of Ethiopia. And that is why Eastern Africa is as dry as it is. It shouldn't it shouldn't environmentally be as dry, but it's this jet that about one kilometer above the ground sort of um, you know pushes this moisture in into the Congo basin where it um, it falls. But when the the biofixable processes break, um, then you sort of see some of these very large flooding events. Um, so there's been sort of major progress by you know. Um, uh, Professor Richard Washington and um, Callum Monday and, and colleagues with the University of Nairobi team again and the Kenya Met Department working together to get better data from this. And they tell me that, you know, these these balloons that they send up, these radio sons with, um, you know, monitoring equipment, um, it, it's just not, there's been no investment in this in East Africa, despite the fact that an estimated 25 million people because of the five failed rainy seasons live live in these areas there's more there's more intelligence and understanding in antarctica where a couple of thousand scientists live than in the whole of east africa and it's it's something the funders i think have to look at themselves you know you know you've mentioned some of them um you know we know who they are but this foundational science if they don't have that they're making policy based on very very limited evidence indeed um, so it's been 
something I've been fascinated through the program, um, how the how the work this, and they now are using that data to better inform the you know the larger global climate models and um, how they how they apply them in this area because it's been a, a missing facet because you know these climate models are ridiculously complicated as we know i mean it's a you know it's a modern wonder what that what they create with them but these topical graphical features there's increasing recognition if you don't include them this is why you get very strange results from that you can get a result you can get a prediction but is it accurate and um you know you know we're we're hoping now that that will be more applied and the partners that we work with again through the met departments and regional bodies uh, you know, taking advantage of this. So we're working with FAO and other groups as well, who are very interested in sort of getting a better sense as, you know, with Chris's work as well to, you know, apply this so people can, you know, plan, predict and respond to these things a lot more effectively in the future. Right. Um, I think that's very interesting. And, you know, you mentioned earlier your uh, background is in economics and stuff. And uh, I uh, did uh, speak with uh, Francois Berton and others uh, from the World Bank uh, on, uh, and I really enjoyed their report, uh, Hidden Wealth of Nations, Groundwater on Groundwater. And uh, they talk about uh, the potential for uh, and suggest that uh, groundwater is underdeveloped in sub-Saharan Africa in these basement, uh, weathered basement uh, aquifers and and uh, that there's potential to expand. And I think I really like, I don't know if um, the, World, the World Bank economists came up with the analogies, but I like their egg carton type of um, analogy where they say there's really not that much to uh, that you can go far wrong because it's a small system and so it will respond quickly. And so if you understood the dynamics of the system, then you could manage it appropriately. Uh, so I think uh, that's uh, really nice. And so maybe uh, there could be an expansion of uh, uh, groundwater development uh, and, you know, also with solar power pumps and things like that in these rural areas where you don't have grid electricity and uh, um, it's difficult to get diesel and all those other things. So I think, you know, things are coming together that should uh, help advance um, and then the understanding that you're developing about financing and governance and all of those sorts of things, I think it should help improve things in the future. Um, we, we shall see. I mean, I, I would be a little bit more cautious, I think. I mean, certainly within Kenya, the aquifer systems, the Nairobi aquifer system has been badly damaged and over abstracted and polluted. Um, so you have to be you know careful with that. And I think sometimes... You know, some of the narratives around it take um, from different sort of alluvial aquifer systems in the eastern eastern India and, you know, where groundwater is very plentiful and replenished compared with some of the African systems. I, I know Alan McDonald and Richard Taylor have been on the program as well. So I think it's very site specific and you have to be quite careful. And this is why I think that foundational science, you have to understand your aquifer system before you start this. It's been common in Takana that many of the politicians campaign on putting in irrigated agriculture and it seems nonsensical irrigating in a, in a desert but it's jobs it's a short term measure so you have these um you have these processes coming in and there was the there was a famous um you know earth observation system that sort of said Takana had all of this water well they did it was very deep it was over a kilometer deep and it was highly saline so it would have cost a huge amount of energy to get it up for very low value, you know, agriculture, um, it just didn't make any sense. But the you know thing, Takana's at water rich. I mean, it's like the Great Nubian Aquifer. But once you scratch at it and you look at the data, it doesn't make any sense. And this is the foundational science side, and this is often what's lacking. You've had um, Sefu on your program as well. You know, another outstanding um, person working on these issues in Africa, building that capacity. Um, you know, strengthening those teams um, locally. And I mean, this is one of the things we argue in the Nature Water paper. You've got to build that not through a two year project, but over a period of time to get, you know, there's outstanding young African scientists who could take on this work. And it's, it should be their work to lead and, you know, move forward. But you've only, you, you've got a handful of people and there should be, you know, dozens and dozens of people doing this work and they should be funded. Um, and so that's one of the things we advocate for to, you know, um, you know, to support that and put the, you know, pr appropriate long-term funding in so, you know, that these groups can um, provide the evidence, provide the leadership um, for these types of issues. It's not, you know, people like you or I, I know you don't work in Africa, but, you know, parachuting in and 
you know, trying to do good. I mean, you you, you try and support these teams um, where they work. And I think, uh, you know, the World Bank and the U USAID and other groups, you know, are recognizing that and are funding the local people, the, the people from those countries. Uh, uh, so that's uh, nice to see. Um, and so I think... Um, you know, when you talk about, for example, the indo gangetic plane or the Nubian aquifer, these are huge aquifers that really need to be managed. But the small, uh, small aquifers that are in basement rocks, the weathered stuff that, you know, Alan McDonald and Matt and stuff like that. So those small aquifers, I think they could support uh, small scale uh, domestic water supplies and maybe the smallholder farmers, you know, for uh, uh, some food security and things like that. So um uh, and and these are dynamic systems that uh, respond quickly so the feedback would be fairly rapid um so you know sustainable development goals 6.1 uh, 2030 is uh, uh, coming up you know how do you think we're doing and um i guess there'll be another program or uh, you know what are your thoughts well, I think I mean the the current assessment. They had a midterm assessment last year, and it, it's fairly dismal reading. Um, you know, for six point one, and all of them, I think, I think we're making much slower progress than we need to be. Um, so, you know, that needs to be rethought a little bit. Um, and this is what we were arguing a little bit in the in the paper that you know the role of science, how you think about this in terms of these longer term trajectories, in terms of how to get to these impacts, it takes time. It doesn't happen quickly. I mean, some of them are decadal or generational to, to move these things forward, but scientific funding is often in these small pockets that, um, you know, policymakers, you know, they take a look at us and they know we're gone in the blink of an eye. So, you know, why spend time and effort working, um, particularly in, you know, some of the the global south in Africa and Asia, et cetera. I mean, they're used to people cycling in and out. So I think that I, I'm optimistic. I think we can change things. I, I think you can look at the examples in Bangladesh and Kenya where we've been working, Ethiopia also, where you can make change, but you just need to think of the architecture of the financing, the institutional relationships of how you set those up if you are serious about these sort of impacts over time. Because a lot of science, I think, unfortunately doesn't achieve, you know, the return on investment that would be possible if if it was translated through. And that's not a sort of open call, give scientists, you know, liberal amounts of money with no holds or bars. You've got you've got to work for it and you've got to deliver results. Absolutely. And you've got to have the right scientists in place. But if you are getting that that sort of progress, you know, how do you have different mechanisms to fund this? And these are institutional challenges for some of the funding agencies because, you know, they they work for the, you know, um, you know, the the parliaments where they work, Congress or whatever, you know, there are, you know, there are checks and balances around this. But I think it's the sort of thing that people need to think through. FCDO were able to do this, um, you know, and credit to them. It was a certain type. It, it was an accountable grant. So we were on an annual cycle of being monitored very, very closely in terms of progress. So that wasn't enjoyable. But, you know, you've got that accountability in the system. So I think, you know, you, you need to find a middle ground here in terms of what different types of funding models, um, you know, might work and might be more effective and, you know, how governments in in some of these geographies would would respond to this. And I think the advances in monitoring now and the, the ability uh, to uh, get feedback on what's working, what's not working, I think that has improved. And I, I really like uh, you, the aspect of your work where you combine social science and your economics background and, and also the physical sciences, you know, together uh, to try to better understand and optimize these systems. Because I'm a huge fan of, I, I read, uh, you know, some on behavioral economics and that it fascinates me because some of it is counterintuitive and uh, mm. You know, you think it's an easy fix and we're all very well able to fix somebody else's problems, you know, but uh, it's, um, you know, when you add that social aspect and and then governments and how they cycle in and out so rapidly, it's very difficult uh, to mm. maintain a strong uh, funding program and relationship uh, like your REACH program uh, to develop uh, the uh, trust uh, with the, the uh, stakeholders and everything and and to advance it. So thank you uh, so much, uh, Rob, for taking the time today to describe some of these programs. And I'm really impressed with what you have been achieving and, and wish you luck in, in your future work. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you.